you actually have insight into my first days that I may not even know because you were the instructor and I don't know when it becomes memorable. So what is like your first memory of me walking into your class? Yeah. So like picture like maybe like a Henry Cavill or a Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> I am like it just a lot of charisma yeah. and just uh, and moving in such a way where it's like it's kind of blurry. You can't see it because <laughs> all the speed. And just like, oh, why is this person so strong? I can just feel it because of the air, um, which is just very unusual, but you can just tell, right? There's like a once in a lifetime type of thing <laughs> where it was just changed from that day forth. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, that, that, that's my earliest recollection. And it uh, just imprinted into my mind. So that, that was uh, early Rafa Sparza. That sounds right. What's up, everybody? It is your friendly neighborhood BJJ podcaster, Raf Esparza, coming to you with another great installment of The Grappling Hour. We have a longtime friend of the show that we'll get to here in a second as he swigs his energy juice, his nectar of choice, a monster energy drink. It still baffles me how he has not been sponsored by Monster themselves. But before we get to our great guest and the wonderful establishment that we are visiting here today, a couple quick reminders. First and foremost, if you like what I do, and I hope that you do, Go on over to patreon.com backslash grappling hour. If you go there, you can see these interviews 30 days before anybody else. And that's just for five bucks for a few extra dollars more. You can see extra bonus videos that aren't available anywhere else, including tape studies where we go with the athletes and we watch the matches or fights with them. We also do a segment called roast raft where people roast my competition footage, which is strangely still the most popular segment we have on the show for whatever reason. <laughs> And then, of course, extra like episodes that we record with the guests that uh, we don't put up for any of those non-paying yahoos, those poor people. We just call them poors. That's what we do. All right. So go there. You can also like, comment, and subscribe. And if you don't know what you want to comment on right now, <clears throat> don't worry. We will give you a prompt by the end of this video. So make sure to stay all the way to the end, and we'll give you something to talk about that's from our conversation here. You can also... Check us out on Spotify and on, uh, what's the other one? Apple Podcasts. You can go buy merch at rapsparza.com backslash merch. Get you some Grappling Hour hoodies. I understand it's hot, but a lot of you compete and you're, you want to stay warm. And that's the perfect way to stay warm is going to get one of those hoodies. But if you want to stay a little bit cooler, there are t-shirts that help support. And every dollar you spend goes right back into the show. Last but not least, join us on our Discord to continue the conversations that we have here. All right, what do I say about our guest? Well, legitimately, you know when you say that you go back a long time with a guest, usually it's a couple years. I go back with this dude 12 years. Now, to the point where John was one of the first people to be an instructor to me, and arguably the only reason I am not trash at jiu-jitsu, and I am happy to report that he has opened up a new gym here in the heart of Hollywood, right next to Trejo's Tacos Donuts? Donuts. Donuts, sorry, yep. okay. We'll get into that in a second. But ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the show one of my very best friends, one, John Evans. John, how are you doing, sir? Oh, great. Great to see you. Uh, always always good, Raph. Um, <laughs> also, uh, definitely sign up for the the paid subscription because Raph is worth it. So Thank you, thank you. I'm going to cut that and splice it up uh, a million different ways. Mm. I have to ask this: When you do this, like branding, and you mm -hmm. tell people to come train here, yes, you have been telling people it's right next to the Trejo's Donuts. Yes, is that part of the reason you sought this place out? Because I have not forgot the location since you mentioned that. Honestly, exactly. Yeah, it's a, I'm, a, I'm a big donut fan in general. So, <laughs> uh, and Trejo's Donuts, like, how many of those are there? So, hopefully, not too many. I, I don't, let's I don't hope not. Many. Yeah, yes. I think you're doing okay. Good. Yeah. I just know that whenever I think of sweets, I have to equate it into how many rounds I have to do 
So all I think about is if I am coming here, I know the part of me that's like, um, um, uh, that's three rounds. Ugh. This is this is a bad idea, John. So I don't know how many people you're going to end up getting to be fat and then curing them of it through great jujitsu and technique. But uh, mm. bless you for doing this. So it is wonderful to see this. I love this. This oh. is one of my favorite things in the world, John. So yes, it is beautiful to see uh, back in its right formation, and we'll we'll get into all of that sort of stuff. But let me ask this: Why the gym? Like. Why break down Academy? Why open it up? And what made you do it? Well, it's a good good thing we asked this, right? <laughs> <laughs> Being that uh, you were one of my I first was, students was, yeah. at the uh, the first iteration of That's the Breakdown right. Academy. One point oh. Yep, we were just a little north of this location, right yeah. in North Hollywood. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was. Um, it was interesting beginnings. There's a lot of <laughs> a, lot, a lot of good came out of it, but um, it ultimately uh, ended, and I fled the country. Uh, and- no, hold on, don't, <laughs> don't do that. When you say fled the country, people think that like the FBI was looking after you. Um, like, <laughs> I'm, you no. know, I'm not saying, oh, but I'm not not saying. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So you left the country, yes, mm-hmm. but you ended up coming back, but. There is a reason you decided to open up. What is the reason? Yeah, I mean, I was teaching so much anyway at multiple gyms um, and uh, just wasn't able to do the things. I mean, you know how stubborn I get with when I get a thought stuck in my head. And and I just wasn't able to do the things that I wanted to do with teaching. Mm. And like teaching is actually something that's really important to me. Uh, It's not like something I do just on the side to make money or... I'm doing it because like this is my lot in life. Now I'm here and I just try to like make as much as possible and just get through to the next day. Like I really care about teaching and I care about uh, my students growth. And uh, and I part of me is the OCD uh, won't let me do things uh, half assed. So uh, I just wasn't able to I was never at a place where I had enough classes or enough control over the curriculum to um, do the things that I wanted to accomplish. And so uh, I knew that unless that changed, um, which it ended up not changing, that I would need to open my own place again to to accomplish those things. So, um, and that's what I did. I'm happy to hear this because for me, you are an artist in the way that you teach. So some people are artists in different ways. You are very good at the way that you you lead your your instruction in your class, and I think part of the reason I've always gravitated toward the way that you teach is there's a real method behind it. So if you aren't able to do a certain method to your standard, it can become frustrating, and it can actually harm the way and the value that your students may have because they may expect a certain kind of thing. Like, oh, John, he teaches just like this. And it's like, well, it's hard to do what I do best if I can't do it the way I like to do it. So to me, hearing you were opening back up, I was incredibly happy and and super stoked. And I said, well, we'll obviously do this. But from afar, I was like, well, why? Because when you do these things, you do think about all of the work you have to do. Opening up a gym, not the easiest thing in the world to do, especially in California. So when you did that, like, was there a moment that you kind of said like, no, I'm back in and, and now I know for sure I want to do this. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good point. It's so much work. And I think the when I opened the first, like the 1.0 uh, Breakdown Academy, it was um, a bit shocking. Um, I also had less uh, less pressure or, you know, like I, I was in a privileged spot at the time. So I didn't need to make a certain amount of income to make sure rent was taken care of or the gym was going to close immediately or whatever. I had a longer timeline, so I had more leeway. It was um, a little bit easier. So um, it even with that, it was still like pretty jarring, like all the <laughs> things. I mean, I think most people that have ever, like not many people have opened a gym before, but anyone that's ever tried, um, it's uh, they're it's very surprising some of the things that you have to deal with. And a lot of people just want to teach because they're teachers and that's what they think everything is. Um, But talking to 
a bunch of people that have run successful gyms when I opened my gym the first time uh, and seeing like, well, how do you get people in the doors? And it's like, really, it's more of you're running a small business. You have to do marketing and administration and it's so much work um, and it's really difficult to do by yourself, like nearly impossible to do it properly, at least. Um, unless you already have a following and you have other people um, that you can pay right away because you have enough students off the bat, which is very unusual, but um, it does happen. But unless you're in that circumstance, it is so much. Um, and so it was something that did kind of shock me and kind of put me off of it for uh, a while. So when the, the gym closed, it was close to um, circumstances outside of my control. Um, but I, like I was somewhat relieved Although, like, it, over the years, in hindsight, I look back and I was like, oh, man, I should have really just, like, I wish there was a way I could have stuck that out and grew it from where it was because I'd already done so much hard work for it. And to see it close after all that hard work was just, like, pretty crushing. Um, so then I thought if I ever was going to do it again, I'd be all in and I'd really, like, do it right um, and I'd have help. Um, which I have now, and uh, it would be different, right? And also just knowing what I know would make it a lot easier. So, um, and it's not easy, but, uh, you know, I think the time was right and I just wasn't going to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish any other way, so. It is very difficult because sometimes you you look like the accomplishment of opening up a gym is like, oh, okay, cool, now I can celebrate that. There is no celebrating that. It's just straight to work. And then when you are opening a gym, good Lord, it's you're teaching, you're exhausted from that. Maybe you're supplementing with privates for certain things. Yep. Okay, great. That's extra time. Yep. That yeah. means less time sleeping. You notoriously terrible at sleep. Yeah. <clears throat> and then the on, on, on top of all of that, then when you have the chance, then it's the marketing, then it's the outreach, then it's coming up with creative ways to make yourself stand out from... 20 other gyms that surround you. And then it's a matter of if you do have students, because I met you at a different gym and it's like, well, I wanted to make it clear. I was like, he's not poaching me because we were just friends. So I just wanted to go support you. And, you know, we found out that different things happened to different people. Yep. And you just thought to yourself, like, this is unreasonable and that people should just be allowed to go train where they want to go train. So I think there were certain factors that we all got a crash course in very quickly. And without even opening a gym, I was like, oh, I'm learning too. And I don't know any of this shit. So that was, uh, it was a lot to take in. But I do, I do bring this up for a specific reason, which is that at the end of that experience, I remembered you telling me, I'm never doing this again. And I was like, oh, okay. So imagine my shock. When I see an Instagram profile of a breakdown academy opening up and I go, oh, do tell of this breakdown academy. <clears throat> Is it the corpse of John yes. Evans? Because <laughs> the John Evans I know said it's not happening again. And yet I was more than relieved to know that you were able to put a part of that past behind you and embrace into the future. So what are you looking forward to doing now? that you do have your own academy? And what are some of the things that you're able to do now that maybe you couldn't necessarily do before that makes it all the more enriching for you? Yeah, you, you probably did find out through Instagram because like I've been looking casually for a while, like over a year, maybe two, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but just things, there was all these roadblocks. Like yeah. it was, you know, especially we're in LA, uh, everything's expensive here. Um, trying to find real estate, like a place where like um, the landlord is okay with it being a gym. There has to be zoned for parking and all kinds of stuff that depending on what city you're in, like, man, there's all different rules. So these things, they get out of hand. And then you usually need investors unless you have, uh, but if you're in jujitsu, you probably have next to no money in the bank. <laughs> right, so right. Um, you probably need investors. And if you have investors, um, then they've put in a certain amount of money and then you can't just be burning through that in record time and then close the gym and not pay the investors back, right? right. So you have to make sure that you have like something sustainable to open up your place. And um, it's like all of that is so difficult. And this one kind of like 
I found out about it and within like a couple of days is basically signed the lease and moved in here and started my own thing. I couldn't even give notice where I was teaching, which I that that part I actually really um, felt bad about, uh, but is just too good of an opportunity to pass up. Um, it's something I've been search searching for for a while. Uh, so I had to just respectfully say, like, well, thank you for the last three years. Um, it was great working with everyone. I wish I could give more notice, but, um, you know, that's, it, it is what it is. I had to jump on this opportunity. So, um, it, and as much as saying that was not um, ideal, I felt extra bad about, I had a bunch of students that I really cared about. Mm -hmm. And uh, also I didn't want to, like, I didn't want anyone to think that I'm like poaching or anything. So I didn't tell anybody. I literally did not like advertise it or talk to any of the students um, on purpose, which felt uh, I'm sure they probably felt like abandoned, but I just couldn't I couldn't do it. Right. Like it just felt like wrong to do. Um, so I, I didn't tell anybody and I just signed it and put in my notice and left and opened this thing like the next day. It was so all of a sudden. So most of the people that were super close to me found out through like Instagram. Um, so it was, uh, yeah. So it's just a, the whole circumstance was just bizarre and it happened all of a sudden. Um, but, uh, a lot of people were kind of waiting for me to open a gym. So I, I feel very fortunate uh, in that regard because there's some really good coaches out there and some people that are much more famous than I am as far as like, at least people know them through competition and stuff. And they have tried opening, doing similar things and just didn't go very well. Um, but so far things have been working out pretty good over here. So I was able to come visit here a couple of weeks ago and it was so refreshing to see uh, your instruction. It felt like no time had passed, but I got made fun of by our, our, our friend Brady, who he just saw me laughing. And he's like, why are you laughing? Nobody else. They're like, John didn't tell a joke. And I was like, I know how he teaches this. And he's like, really? I go, oh, yeah, I absolutely. No time has passed. I know exactly what he's going to do. <laughs> and he'll explain it in a perfect way that it is nice to know that the exact same level of excellent technique had not changed, but that no one else will find it humorous other than me who's heard it and who probably has the same complaints as the blue belt here did <laughs> five years, six years ago. So that's why I was like, oh, that's very funny. And uh, it was one of the first things you were teaching me. I, I think I had mentioned this was um, you, we worked, I think, once in your garage and I was always having issues trying to get stuff and we were workshopping something and you had just seen something on, I think, BJJ for over 40. Mm. And it was a, a particular move. It didn't really have a thing yet. Okay. But you were so geeked about it. We drilled it and then we're, we're rolling. And then, you know, when you have your instructor and you don't know if you're catching them for real, but you're kind of trying to work it as best you can. Mm. And I thought I hit something and I was like, I have no idea if I hit it. And you're like, oh my God, you got it. And I was mm. like, no, I have no idea. What did I do? Did I do it wrong? And you're like, you got the move. It works. And I, I remember kind of, thinking I, of that. I kind of remember this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was what is wrongly referred to as a scorpion deathlock, which is not. Sting does a scorpion deathlock. <laughs> this is just some weird arm trap that you do from the side. And that was the move you were teaching uh -huh, when I came yes. to visit. I do remember that. Yes. And now, like, I actually use that move from a million different places, and I love it. Because it's uh, deadly, it's so John. And it's still, like, relatively unknown, weirdly. Um, but yeah, I remember, and you did catch me with it. It was legit. And I was like, oh, because it was new to me too. So I wasn't sure if it was like, if it could work, um, and you were still figuring out. So it's like, it, it's gotta be really good if, if, uh, if I'm more yeah, novice, that's, yeah, yeah you, you, you were newer than too. And like, and also brand new to the move and you still yeah. got it. And it was like a legit tap. And I was like, oh my goodness, like this is, we're onto something here. But so, the, there's a cool. few factors that are playing here. One, being a student, being like, this can't happen. And then two, <laughs> being like, uh, your, most people, they'll have like a little bit more anger or whatever. Yours was emphatic enthusiasm, oh. <laughs> which actually was more nerve wracking than actual outright, you shouldn't have caught me. Like I was actually more thrown by being like, I think he's more excited than I am, which now <laughs> makes me question if I did it for real. And then meanwhile, you're just like, science is working kind of face. <laughs> so uh, oh. when we were doing it, um, we were drilling it and I, I let the person, I let Brady have more uh, reps 
And he's kind of looking at me. He's like, why do you need to, don't you need to get your reps in? I was like, I'm not saying I'm great at it. Mm. I'm just saying I have reps with it. And then we did it. And then you look, you're like, oh yeah, that looks good. I go, oh, okay, cool. Well, this is your work. So okay. this is not anything I did. So I want to try to kind of circle back to something that I, I wanted to bring up, which is what are you able to do now in terms of curriculum and in terms of what you're able to teach now that you're kind of head honcho here? Because I mean, the nice part about this is when you have the freedom to teach, you can do whatever you want to do. Now, when I go over to Milton's, I only see them really once a week. So sometimes I'm like, yo, we're going 10 minutes extra because I just, I'm on this. I don't want you guys to not be able to do this tomorrow and lose this. I'm willing to spend 10 extra minutes sure. explaining this concept. But now time, you got all of it. Yes. So what are, what are things that you are able to do now that you run this thing? So when you first opened a gym, a little <laughs> bit of a, a blessing and a curse, like I was so gung ho to like, oh my God, I can like just do curriculum and I can make everything the way I want it to be. And I like had all these things, and especially because it was so all of a sudden, right? Like I was not expecting to open this gym when I did. Like I was casually looking and all of a sudden it was like, um, sign the contract, you're in, you're good to go. We start like Wednesday. It's like, wait, wait what? What's going on? <laughs> like it's, it's just Monday. It's like it's Tuesday or whatever. Like, okay, okay, I guess I could do that. So I didn't have like anything ready for like the next day. Um, but, uh, so I, but I was just like, everything's buzzing. Like, what am I going to show? I'll, well, today I'll just show stuff that I was going to show maybe at the other place that I was teaching. And uh, now I'll have some time and go over curriculum and do that. But it's so much work. Um, so it's a, a good friend of mine that was very wise, uh, that I got a, learned a lot from that used to run a very successful gym said to me once that for every one hour of teaching that you spend in the gym, you spend, you need to spend two hours of marketing and, and administration facts. And, uh, if you think about it, if you teach like two to three class, like say two sessions a day, so like a, a noon session and then maybe a night session. So maybe two classes at night and then one class in the day, if you leave to get to the gym at like, I don't know, 10 30 AM, you show up for that noon class, right? You open the doors, everything's good. You teach, it's a two hour class, you have cleaned the mats, you talk to your students afterwards, 2.30, now you gotta go shower, now you gotta eat. If you're gonna go back home, maybe travel, right? Um, and then try to do any little errands and fix stuff with the job, work on curriculum, whatever, market stuff. Um, and then, uh, or not even to take the marketing part out, right? <laughs> it's just anything. Um, and, uh, then all of a sudden you just have a three hour window before you have to be back for that, like 5 30 PM class. Right. And you have to shower and eat and do all of those things in between, get ready for the next class. And so like that actually ends up being next to no time. Like maybe you end up having like a total of like 30 minutes, um, when all of that's done. Right. And so now you teach that class and then you teach the next class after it. And then you're like seven to 9 PM. Uh, and then same thing and it's 930 and you're cleaning the mats and you're talking to people and then it's like, okay, well, it's time to leave. It's like 930, you know, you can get home till 10, 10, 15 and you were just out 12 hours. Right. So it's yeah. like when, and that was like, you're just teaching. So when do you spend the double that time doing marketing and administration as one person? It's basically impossible. Right. And when are you sleeping? When are you eating? It's, um, is pretty rough. So uh, I think people don't realize how quick the time goes uh, because you can't just do these little menial things like marketing and administration, which are really important, but they're like kind of looked at as like, a, oh, like we can do this as an afterthought or it's just, it won't take that much time. But even just like going through emails and messages takes a long yeah. time, um, if you, especially if you want to put any kind of thought into it. So, uh, man, it's just, it's a, it's a lot. And I think a lot of teachers fail when they open up a gym and I was shocked by it too myself because I was just like, Oh, I'll open a gym, teach and people come and <laughs> like, nobody knows where your gym is or like how to find you or if you're a good teacher or, or what jujitsu is. Right. So like you have yeah. to like do all of these things and where does the time, the time go? So it's, um, I think it's like shocking to a lot of people. So I was not able to work on the curriculum doing everything myself as much as I wanted to. Mm. Um, and then you have to get to a place where you're like, 
out of the red in the beginning so you can hire some assistant instructors. So that way you'll have a little bit extra free time to work on those things yourself, right? Um, and uh, so I'm not there yet. So because we're, <laughs> we're brand new, right? We've only been open just, just under like two months, I think. Uh, so I'm just trying to like, I'm not sleeping the best, um, but I'm also like trying to use every little moment to like figure out, well, what am I going to teach this week and like what details do I want to show and then like, oh, well, how am I going to boost this post to like make sure people are aware of the gyms here. And yeah, so you just do your best, but it's a lot though. And people I think don't realize that. I think one of the wildest things that I saw about the first time was you know, there was stuff that I remembered mentioning to you just from the outside where I'd be like, oh, hey, maybe you should do this or do that. And it was mostly because I knew how overwhelming it was that I thought, oh, okay, well, I'd be a bad friend if I just didn't offer some outside perspective. The hard part for me is I also would offer, but you're so good at just being like, hey, I really want it to be my message. I want it to be true to what it is I do. And I go, well, I can't do any more than that. So when I saw that you had some help here now yeah. and the way that you run things now, I was so happy because I go, okay, cool. There's a difference in how you're approaching it this time that I think is critical for long-term sustainability. Also that you don't die because the unfortunate part about being the franchise is you kind of have to stay healthy and alive. Yeah. So we got to make sure that you are you are of sound mind and of sound body. Mm. But having said that, you know, what is great is I want to just throw this out there for you, though, mm. which is I think the weird part is you might be able to scale back some of the things that you think of core curriculum and scale up more time for the stuff that you're doing for the marketing or the other things, because I think you got the jujitsu stuff down. Like the weird part is you're always trying to give people the most up to date information. So that means sometimes we have new approaches to jujitsu yeah. or we do a technique a different way. I really think you're so tapped into the modern world of what jujitsu is that you could probably stand to watch a little bit less of jujitsu to like try and get people the top tier and realize that you'll probably still give them a 97% out of a hundred. If you just spend maybe an hour or two less doing more research on other things, because I, I'd like to tie this together. So this is what a good interviewer does. What's been great about the past few years is that in the most recent year specifically is that you and I have gotten to, do what we like to do best, which is commentate together. And uh, both you and our pal, Kevin Widows, had made good reference to me, to the good people over at Spar Star. And it has been phenomenal to be able to work with you because for a period, we didn't get to work together a ton. And it's out of control from you, out well, of control from me. Unfortunate. But it's not for lack of want. It was just, there weren't a ton of positions. And sometimes it's just a John venture. It's just a me venture. Yeah. But when we get to team up, I just feel like we get to do some of the best commentary work together and it's enjoyable. And I feel like people enjoy us because they appreciate that we're actually friends. So what has that been like in the past three years for you in terms of, of those commentary gigs? Because you've been the steady presence now at Sparstar. Yeah, um, it's uh, it's been interesting. Like, uh, I mean, like I, I did, if, if people don't know, like I did commentate for Flow for a very long time. Um, and uh, since basically since the pandemic, um, they kind of shifted the way that they were doing things and people that they were working with. Um, so I haven't really, I mean, I've worked some things that have been on Flow, but they weren't for Flow. They were just for the, the tournament organizers. So um, I mean, I like to tell people if I've ended up on flow, I think they made a mistake. So I don't think that's necessarily your case. But when you say there are less opportunities, I think it's because they don't necessarily have uh, the same one or two people. They use every single thing. I think they try to split them up. Yeah, they're more trying new things, if you and, would. Yeah. yeah. And so and I, I think like the way that they structured things financially to change. So 
Um, yeah, so it's uh, you know that's it's like working with Flow. I, I worked a lot with Flow. There was a one point where it was like every other weekend. I feel like I was flying out somewhere to a fight to win, like fight to win seven or whatever, and, and like uh, or commentating like the the worlds or like whatever. So um, yeah, like I I was working so much with them, and then now I was. Uh, commentating a lot with like kevin he's probably the the other other than you is like the only other commentator i've commented commentated like a lot of events yeah. with um and have a good rapport with um or have a good rapport with other people too but like where it was just that natural like your friends you like the person as a person and you just can hang out and and you just feed off each other well yeah. right um and i think i've commentated with you like far and away more than anyone else uh and it's soothed like i know if i'm working with you you're also like underrated like one of the one of the like low-key best commentators out there but people you're the problem with you is that you're really good at like other things that jujitsu needs a lot and so i think people see that and see how much better you are at those things than everyone else is at those things and they're like we need you here so then your your commentary gets overshadowed because the commentary levels come up to a like at least in i mean it's you know like it's at least a lot better than it used to be um so they don't need you as direly in that position as they do in like other ones but then but you're a great commentator and i think um the, you just get pulled in a lot of other places so unfortunately so that those the combination of all of those things kind of just described as a mexican john <laughs> we just kind of get plugged just in in literally it. every position sometimes they're like nah you don't need to do commentary we got like some janitorial work he'll go ahead and take care of i just i think of it like this i'm a hired gun and i like to be able to uh help whatever the production needs at any given time but if i really stuck to my guns I would just do commentary forever and I'd be happy. It's just, I come from a very showbiz, okay, what does the show need? What do you yep. need? How does it work? If I need to be on, that's fine. If I'm not on, that's okay too. I just prefer like if I have the option to work with one of my good friends and do that commentary. And that's what we got at Sparstar was they were like, oh, well, let's see how this goes. And I just remembered looking at them like, Sure, I, I I hear you, but I promise you we work well together. It's gonna be good. It's yeah. just, do you want that? <laughs> and some people maybe they don't it's want true. it, but at the same point, I go, I promise you, for the certain touch you need for amateurs, it is such a hard gig to be respectful, to be kind to try to give the insight of where you see their technique is heading mm -hmm. while at the same point being honest about where it is. So I don't think you and I overstate things like, oh, the, we got the newest <laughs> Israel Adesanya here. It's like, oh, he's developing this skill and man, it's very impressive given he's been training for two years or we just learned about him tonight and this is what we've we've seen him do or this is what this female athlete is doing that she didn't do a year ago. So for me, I like that challenge. It's just sometimes different roles come up, but when the dial lands and it's both me and you getting on the call, it's just like, I don't know. I like to tell people I go, "Oh, it's just it's just commentary tonight." I don't have to work behind this. I'm not pulling the strings. I'm not pushing buttons. I'm just talking with my friend. I, I hate you so much. Raph. Like, <laughs> oh my God. Like as soon as like anytime I'm in a gig with you and you're like, you, we're either commentating or you're uh, hosting or you're doing interviews. And it's like, oh man, like Raph's right in his element. And then I'll see you go over and like somebody will start to, I'll be like, wait, what's that production guy doing going over towards Raph? What's it? Is he asking him a question? I'm like, oh no, oh no. They're going to find out. He's good at this, <laughs> and then we'll never see him on camera ever again. And it's like, oh, you son. <laughs> like, ah, oh, it never fails. Like, as soon as, I mean, again, like, this is where they need, like, yeah. the, the, a lot of, like, um, you know, like, uh, this is not the case with Sparstar, which is probably why that you're still able to stay in commentary, um, thankfully. But, like, uh, with a lot of other things, like, they, it's so disorganized and it's just a bunch of people trying to figure stuff out or there's no budget or whatever. And as soon as, like, they see, like, oh, this guy really knows everything about production and he really knows what he's talking about, like, uh, the, you're just, like they'll yank you away immediately and you're just in the dungeon of production. 
uh, and that's where you'll live the rest of your days and I'll never see you again. It's horrible. Yeah. I hate it. Yeah, I know. I mean, listen, it's weird to every once in a while sit back and see something not working to its fullest and then go, I think I know how that works. And then somebody goes, oh, you want? Yeah. All right. Let me. That's what I'm talking about, Raph. That's a. You, you could have just, you could have I know, I should have shut up. Oh my I God. know, I know, I know. It's my yep. dumb fault. It's too, when you can be the glue that brings everything together, that's too invaluable. They can't be like, well, this guy's the best interviewer in <laughs> MMA or uh, jujitsu or whatever. But, um, you know, we need to make the show run. So uh, I just like to like it here. <laughs> to this, which is that there aren't that many good people. <laughs> and that at a certain point you go, well, I guess I'm top five of this now. Okay. <laughs> Or somebody doesn't know how to hold a camera and you go, I may not know as much as this person on a camera, but I'm functional enough to be able to fix something in a pinch. So, uh, yeah, there's definitely been some times where I've taken off the headset and been like, all right, John, cover. I got to go do this thing. <laughs> I, but yeah, I hate no. those times. I hate those times. <laughs> but <laughs> like, we're very... will I ever see him again? <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> he just doesn't come yeah, back. Yeah, like, you know, mm. we're very lucky, though. Spar Star, Rob so and good. his team, yep. all... All of my They're, my concerns are minuscule. I can just focus on trying to tell good stories, trying to commentate in the moment. And then I think loan a little bit of our rapport so that audiences aren't bored to death. Because the other thing that happens is no one, nobody who ever wants to lie and say like, this is a good fight when it's not a good fight. So then sometimes when it's not the most exciting fight, it really does lean upon, well, they like each other and they're friends and they're finding a nice way to say, maybe not the best. And then we do our, our business and we usually find some common ground. But, uh, you know, John and I are people who, if we ever get feedback, we try to take it very seriously. We try to make uh, adjustments in the moment. And yeah, sometimes we, we do get um, notes and I should relay a couple to you. Mm. Um, Although I have to say, with Sparsa, we don't get a lot of that, like, uh, you know, even with, because it's amateurs, so you'd expect, like, oh, they're, they're, these are guys are not the greatest. But, like, the the matchmaker, Heather, is... It's great. So, like, that has got to be yeah. such a hard job. Like, what do you base it off of? But she, like, knocks it out of the park every time. It's, a, a, like, it's it, very surprising. It's definitely not them. It's just, it, it is part of the mechanism of people see the UFC... And they have a certain idea of what that presentation is. And they think, man, John Anik is the smartest guy in the world. And he does a lot of research. But they have teams that also help with their athletes. And famously, DC was like, I didn't look at any of the tapes. And you go, maybe, hey, bud, somebody did the homework for you. And I would kill for somebody to help oh me with my, my homework. Oh, my God. And but so when we're on live and they go, they're not like those UFC guys. And I go, yeah, maybe. I don't know, man. Give me three people to work on a team. And then let's see what happens. Oh, you're, you're, you were lifting the curtain right now. Oh, the, this, this, working commentary <laughs> can be so thankless. Uh, it's like I, we've both received yes. um, criticisms and seen like our, some of our colleagues that are very good to receive like ridiculous criticism uh, <laughs> uh, about things that people have no idea about. I remember I had to work one event where I had to watch I was they, they sit you because you're not always sitting right by the action yeah. like you know as far star we're kind of back we could see the the thing but they have a you know the production team's good there so they pipe the yeah. um you know the feed right to a monitor that's nice and clear right in front of you we can see everything it's good right it's like a it's it, you know unless you're sitting like cage side which sometimes can be obstructed too like there's not really in argument for having a better setup right um, but with other events that uh, we've worked in, I've worked as like, uh, they don't realize like sometimes you're under the bleachers somewhere. You can't even see people yeah. and maybe you're looking at like, if one event I was looking at, it, it was like, I think it was like 17 different little tiny screens on a 14 inch monitor that was like five feet away. And I'm like, uh, and I remember getting like hate texts from somebody that trained at somebody's gym. It was like, how do you not know this guy? He's uh, he won brown belt worlds or whatever like last year, and it was just like, oh, you're part of his team. Like I couldn't even make out who it was, and like the, the I couldn't read the name of it. So I'm just <laughs> like, I you know you you do the best, but people don't realize like what you're working with with certain productions, um, and uh, sometimes it is like 
hilarious like how bad some of the setups are especially if it's like a newer organization or something like that or they just like have no budget or you know like we we have and you just have to do the best that you can and they don't realize too that like the big production things uh, even with like esports mm-hmm. which has a ton of money in it weirdly um they'll they'll take all the commentators they'll pay them of course they, they, they send them out to a place like usually where the tournament is and for a week prep them on all the things that they want them to hit on what they want them to say they'll have packets of stuff that people have studied and put together and it's like when you go to some events it's just like who is like who's this guy like they don't even know right they're just like dude do your best go for it and uh make some stuff up do you happen to personally know them like no, well, maybe you should personally do, like. What? There's like 25 <laughs> people on this card. I can personally know all of them. I found out what the card was yesterday, right? Am it's I like speed crazy. dating these people? Yeah, Get it's, out of here! It's so like to be compared to like uh, those two different types of production where yeah. it's like very a lot of money goes into it, and it's one where it's just like do your best, and we so, don't know anything. Like, <laughs> here's what I should say: it's and, and all of those are correct, but we we have gotten some small feedback. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you a little bit about them and why I think it is funny. Okay, so one of the first ones was uh, there was a gentleman. And this one was my bad, but there was a gentleman who we commentated on his fight and we looked up on his Instagram and I referred to him as Berto, but his name was Beto. And he told me afterwards, because I interviewed him and we sat down and I was like, hey, did I call you the wrong name? Like, I owned up to it. I didn't ask him to tell me what he thought of what I did. Sure. I just said, like, I think I got that wrong. And he just goes, yeah, you did. And I hate watching that fight because of that. And all you do is say, I'm sorry. And then you move on and then you keep it in the edit. You say, all right, well, there you go. I'm not going to hide it. It just It's in the moment. It's live television. And it's better than sitting there and being like, well... Let's be honest, bet those dumb. You should, where's the name? How do you just get rid of the R? If your name is Roberto, you can't just get rid of a letter just because you don't like it. And uh, you don't do that. What you do is you say like, hey kid, sorry, are you okay? And he's like, I gotta be honest, there was a couple cool things you said and you did this. And I go, okay, so you don't hate it completely. Number two. Recently at the last Spar Star, there was a young man who came out and he was coached by Benil Darush. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Darush. And yeah. uh, he was really good. He won his fight. I yes. did an interview with him. Yeah. I went down to King's Anaheim. Oh, I didn't know that. And yeah. we were talking. He was good. He was yeah. really, really good. And I mean, anyone was with Benny, though. Like, Benny's... At, uh, Benny's great. super... And yeah. you knew, you're like, well, if he's here, maybe this could be really good. Yep. It's not always yeah. a, a 100% science, but it's one where you go, uh, I think he's going to coach him well. Yeah. And amateur, let's see how this plays out. And he did so well. And then this dude told me, he was like, um, you guys called me a Dagestani on the broadcast. And I was like, I know for sure I did. Oh, it was a me? And I go, well, John, I don't usually go, look at this Dagestani over here. Yeah. And that's... I thought, I was like, I, I remembered there was one guy who wore a hat. And I go, I know John was really fixated on somebody's oh, said, hat, but it yes. wasn't him. Oh, yeah. And I go, that was the That was the, Kur- it was a Kyrgyzstan. Yes, right? And I yes. called him a Kazakhstan. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, yeah, were yeah, so yeah. bad and you're correcting yeah. yourself on air. Yeah. But this dude was telling me, he was like, yeah, dude, uh, you guys called me uh, a Dagestani because of my wrestling. And he goes, I actually took it as a compliment. And I go, oh, okay, I'm glad you're taking it well. And I go, yeah. And he's telling me, he's like, I think it was the other guy. And I go, yeah, it sounds like the other guy. I go, but... Well, listen, it's easy to get something wrong. If you look, I mean, if your name, Joshua Brown. Yeah, I guess we did fuck up on that one. Yeah, Joshua Brown would not be a Dagestani. I think I remember that, that and I think I said like. Uh, he wrestles I like said, one? Yes, I think uh-huh. I said something like that. And uh, he probably just like, but I don't think I call, like okay. I wouldn't just say somebody is that. So the only I'm time is sure. with that, the, the Kazakhstan, because I like. Because I was you like, corrected on it, you made a claim. I was like, what kind of hat was that? I Google. I was like, maybe it's Kazakhstan. I Googled Kazakhstan hat and it was the hat. And Google <laughs> ru- like did me wrong. Because then I, I looked up like uh, <laughs> other hats that could be in that region. And it was totally this other. But was, yeah. I think it goes back to the larger point, which is. We do the best job we can. And even as this kid's telling me, he's like, yeah, you could do, you did call me a Dagestan. And I was like, did we? And then you go, listen, I don't have enough to verify and tell you yes or no. I go, maybe John did. 
And if you did and you're taking it as a compliment, that's pretty dope. And like, you have a good sense of humor about it. But I feel like where most people might be shy in those situations, I just try to have a good sense of humor and just indulge it and say like, hey, did it hurt your feelings? Did it make you not win the fight? If you listen to it, do you laugh? And then when you come back to it and you you look at it, it's the stuff that we go, man, I wish I got this right or did that. But there's always another one. And then when you go back, you can't harp on that. You can't be in that moment. You You just do the best you can in that exact thing. So that's why I just tell people, I'm like, I guarantee you guys, you will sound dumb at some point. Oh. But the way that you mitigate it is how you react to it. Mm -hmm. And I tend to be very uh, self-deprecating about it. But at the same point, just telling people like, oh, yeah, that wasn't good. But what about the other 95%? I'm pretty sure we're... Mm, I'm pretty sure we got facts about you that you did not really advertise about your, yourself, young man. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a thankless job. It's, it's funny that uh, because when we receive the, those criticisms, like it's like, oh, you said my name wrong or something like that. I I remember like one of the first people I ever commentated with when I first started pro commentary. Mm -hmm. um, he was a, a person that was very beloved in the sport uh, uh, at the time, maybe still is, um, doesn't commentate as much, but was getting paid like, you know, quadruple or more than what I was getting paid. And um, was like definitely the main attraction as far as commentary goes. And I would be like, um, what do you think of like, how do you pronounce this name or whatever? And he, and he just like on air, like he's like, uh, said something like brazenly said something that was absolutely not even close to possibly being <laughs> right. And he did it on purpose. And he's like, I don't care. And I'll just call him that the whole time. And the, that's, he's like, I don't think twice about it. Like you're going to get the names wrong. So just might as well just like really get them wrong. If you're going to, you know, just take a stab at it and stick with it and, and <laughs> own it. It's fine. Like, like if they don't talk to you beforehand and you, do, you don't know how to pronounce it, then just whatever. So to hear like somebody being like, you just said them it's slightly off or whatever, uh, thinking about that guy's approach to it, just like, be like, yeah. And I'm, and you're still that name to me. And like, you'd probably still call him that for every fight. Uh, just to, just to, to throw it out there. That's fair. It's I, pretty funny. I like to tell people sometimes when I don't know how to say a name, I think it's just like you're about to hit the peak of a roller coaster where you go, oh boy, here it goes. It's just coming out a certain way. Can't promise you it's right. And then, you know, like I said, I, I try to clean up afterwards and talk to them. But I will say the majority of fighters that I've interviewed that we've commentated their fights are very kind. And without prompting, you know, sometimes I ask jokingly if I think it was a good fight or there was something unique that happened or I knew that I said something that was like kind of interesting or funny. And I'll be like, oh, what'd you think of it? Because I go, I know I said this. For the most part, unprompted, they're like, hey, man, I really appreciated that. Or you knew that I do this. And I go, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I like that style or I like that technique that you do. And they go, yeah, yeah, I like you guys. And I go, okay, cool you feel like you're one of us. So I feel like that's something that we we sneak in. But it's been nice to be able to do that and to return to that. And when people are like, when's the next time you guys are working together? Well, the next spar star, dude. I go, yeah, honestly, yeah. for us, it's we're hired guns and it's just a matter of when something comes up. But you're always at the top of my list and I know you've put recommendations for me in, in different facets too. So it's just like, hey, listen, if you guys are ever hiring, I mean, we're mostly available. It just depends on if he's got a teacher or whatnot, but very available. If especially you come to LA, because I don't, you know what I mean? Like the flights, like, are you paying for them? What's the travel like? When do I get back home? Is it Spirit Airlines? Is it an airline? Does it fly? Does the engine work? Like, these are very basic questions I have. I'm not going to say Spirit Airlines. What? Like the princess and the pea over here. <laughs> yeah, I need a working engine on my airplane. <laughs> Jesus, Raph, yeah, I know. come on! I know. Oh my uh, goodness, it's like you haven't been working uh, for <laughs> professional uh, combat sports for a while. Raph like would get hired a lot more if he just probably really just, yeah. stuck with the CD as on the outside of the jet. Yes, that's it would, true. It would work every that's once true. in a while. It's a bit cheaper out there. So I want to ask this because I don't. I mean, I think over time we've talked about this, and maybe we did it on verbal tap. But we always like to ask people their origin stories of how they got involved. So for you, mm, born in the darkness, well, you you've you're just visiting. Uh, 
uh, what is happening here? When did this turn into a Nine Inch Nails album? Like, what's (laughs) happening here? (laughs) Okay, John Evans, Mm. Mm. let's paint the scene Mm. for people who don't know how you started your journey because Mm -hmm. we know you as this student turned teacher Mm. turned doctorate in the world of, yeah, I mean, you got a black belt. You know what I mean? That's a doctorate time. All right. So you've put in your time, but Mm. we didn't all grow up with young John Evans. What was young John <laughs> Evans like, sir? <laughs> that's, uh, oh man. That's, Did that's, he play sports? That, ah, there we go. Did he care I, about I, I see what you're talking about. I'm, my, Wait, you no, took this me, isn't free you therapy, took me way dude. Back. Like, I'm what's like, what's happening? Let me just lie down for a second. Ah. <laughs> Uh, and then he <laughs> smacked me, and I yelled, <laughs> and, it, and he was a doctor. And uh, no, um, yeah, it was way back. Uh, <laughs> Jesus, rap. Um, uh, this, this is what you get at the end of the day. Yep. yep. Um, no, uh, yeah, super unathletic. Like I was just like uh, I back for for you Gen Zers out there. Like oh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons used to be something that you would like get shoved into a locker for at school like it was not cool there was no shows about it you were a nerd and the people didn't talk to you uh and that was me right like i i, I literally played dungeons and dragons uh and uh, computer games and um you know like a uh, magic the gathering when it first came out and like i was just a super nerd and i liked technical things and i liked building computers and uh it stuff and and that's that was me. And I never did like I literally ran the mile in high school, and it was like thirteen plus minutes, which is like a walk. Um, and that was my the extent of my athleticism. Is that what they told you at the end of it? Where they're like, you could have just walked that, sir. No, but I remember being a child, uh, and my my mom and I would go out and uh, do walks in the park, and I would ask her like, how long do you think that was, and how far do you think we went? Like oh, about a mile, it's about like 15 minutes to walk this mile or whatever. And I remember when I was in high school, running the mile and then like hearing my my time and being like, oh my God, that was the time. That was just like <laughs> a minute and a half faster than I used to walk it as a seven-year-old. <laughs> cool. Um, but I had no aspirations to be athletic. I didn't have much uh, athleticism in me, so it didn't really bother me. I just wanted to go and uh, research nerdy things and um, and I enjoyed that and that was fine. Um, but, uh, yeah, then later on in my life, I was in a bad motorcycle accident and, uh, the uh, one thing at least is I'm very stubborn and the, told me that maybe I wouldn't ever be an athlete ever if I, uh, kind of said it jokingly, uh, to my mom while I was recovering and, uh, you know, like the, the, as soon as they said that, I was like, well, never be an athlete. Excuse me. Uh, the, like I will, I will prove you wrong, and I will do MMA, the hardest thing that I can think of. And uh, so, like, it took me like a year to recover from that. Let's stop here, John, yeah. for yeah. a second. Okay, so you basically are here today, opening up this academy based <laughs> off of someone talking smack to you that was not talking smack to you, more of a dare. Uh, it was a doctor, though. So. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> Is, is somebody is somebody with some authority and uh, somebody that should have a, something that should be respected? And I was like, oh, excuse me, I can't do what? Do you know how many patients that doctor sees per day? Like, could you imagine if this was the case for like two or three other people where he's like, well, this dude can't read. He's never going to become anything. Becomes a senator the next week. Oh, yeah. Oh, this dude mm-mm, looks like. He's real fat, and all of a sudden he's David Goggins. So, like, who knows what this doctor did and the inspiration he had? Let me ask this. Mm. All right, so I know that you're talking about like, oh, I'm a big nerd, blah 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 mm. blah. Mm. Okay, now this is false for bragging, bragging about this is a yeah. this is a false thing Oof. because if you've ever rolled with John, and people have told me this too when they've rolled with them for like the first time, lightning like, quick. I mean, no, but you get you get the other one where they're like. Is he so strong? Oh. Go, oh, he's very okay. He's very strong. Like, so you don't get to just be like, well, I was a nerd, and they just put me in this locker. And the second oh, part of this that, story, it's like listening to myself there. Uh, well, okay. no, everybody knows the impression of you is like very dead set on yeah, what I want to do. It. Good, yeah. it is, 
when I choose to do it, it was is. That, was this not? It was not the impression okay. that time. Okay. It was maybe you doing an impression of an impression. But the second part of this that just gets glossed over is mm. super nerd young John Evans mm -hmm. gets to be a cool guy on a motorcycle. So how do these things go together? Because to me, you're like, I was a nerd. Great. I don't see too many nerds on motorcycles, John. Uh, I, <laughs> I don't know. Like I, I had a girlfriend and I got my heart broken and uh, I thought I was like, I just like didn't see a reason for, to keep going on. So I just, uh, not like I was like done with life or anything, but I was like having a hard time like enjoying things or seeing like, like, well, what's the point of this? Like I got my yeah. heart broken. Like what's the, you know, what's going to happen? And so like, then I was like, Oh, I was, I, I know motorcycles are bad and, uh, and I should never do those. <laughs> right. And then like, uh, I had a friend that rode motorcycles and he like pulled up from something that he was going on to ride or whatever. And he pulled up and I was supposed to beat him somewhere. And I was like, Oh, that looked really cool. And I never, like, I always thought like they're bad. I shouldn't do it. Like, I think my dad got in like a wreck when he was younger and my grandfather got in a wreck when he was, yeah. So it was like, we, there was a history. So like I'd heard casually, but I never wanted to do that. And I saw my friend pull up on one and it looked so cool. It was like a new like Yamaha R1 or something. And at the time it just, it was like the coolest thing ever. And I was like, I, I know I shouldn't, but I think I want to. <laughs> uh, so like that was, it was a very specific. Uh, How much of your life is just dares? Like, yeah, this is like 95%. You yeah. going from, mm, I know it's bad for me and I know we have a history of it on my family, but you know what I'm going to do? Get a motorcycle. I'm pretty sure the dude at the dealership, if he knew this stuff would have been like, Hey man, I sell a lot of these things and I want to make this commission, but I'm going to have to tell you no. Yeah. Instead you double down on that. Mm. Then mm. you get into an accident. So mm. yikes, family history. Yeah. Thank God you're okay. Yep. It did take some time to recuperate. It was, yeah. And that was the motivation. Did you have any want to do any kind of fight? Had you ever been in fights before? Um, I mean, I, that's like a little kid. Uh, but the, like, you know, after like, uh, I mean, by the time I was in like middle school or whatever, like the, I wasn't doing anything like that. Um, so like, it, like I always was stubborn and I always like, uh, I, I didn't like it when people were like mean to people or mean to me or whatever. So I'd stand up for myself, but, um, but it was nothing that I like. I think like a part of me liked it, but I don't like hurting people or anything. So it was never something that I thought too much about. But then I, when I was a, like 16 or 17, I worked in like a video store. And there was like a VHS of like the ultimate fighting championship, which you might've heard of. Mm. Um, and there was this uh, Brazilian guy named uh, Royce Gracie. Mm. And, uh, <laughs> and I popped the VHS in, dating myself here, um, popped the VHS in and watched it and was like, how is this little guy beating up all of these humongous people uh, in his pajamas? And uh, that I, I just kind of had that in the back of my mind, like, well, there's something to this. I should probably learn this at some point. Uh, but then being like the antithesis of athleticism or uh, having a desire to, to be athletic, um, I just never happened. But that was the catalyst. I was like, oh, you said, no, well, I'm going to do that thing that I remembered from back when I was a teenager. And I did. And that was like, uh, it took a year to recover. And that was uh, 19 years ago. And I've been training for 18 years now. So good God. Yeah. yeah that's well, yeah. Yeah. That's, okay. Well, I'm glad you're stubborn in that respect. There are some other things that you're stubborn about that I don't particularly love. That's fair. Yep. But yeah, I think it did provide some good results for us here. I like to ask people about their first experience uh, doing jiu-jitsu or MMA, but I'm going to pause here for a second mm. because you actually have insight into my first days that I may not even know. So what is your first recollection of me? Because you were the instructor and... I don't know when it becomes like a memorable because a lot of times, again, yep. as an instructor now myself, sometimes there's a moment where I go, all right, you're cool. I like you. All yeah. right. You're my guy. But you may not know them. They may be visiting your class for what? 
two, three years before you kind of know who they are. Wait, what? <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? Like it takes a minute where they might go from just somebody who's taking your class to like, oh, I like this kid. He's a good kid. And they become a friend. Sure. So what is like your first memory of me walking into your class? Yeah. So like picture like you see like, um, I don't know, like a maybe like a Henry Cavill or a Daniel Day Lewis, uh, and like <laughs> it just uh, a lot of charisma yeah. and just uh, and moving in such a way where it's like it's kind of blurry, you can't see it because <laughs> all the speed and just like oh, why is this person so strong? I can just feel it because the air, um, which is just very unusual, but you can just tell, right? There's like a once in a lifetime type of thing. <laughs> Where it was just changed from that day forth, um, and that's uh, yeah, that, that, that's my earliest recollection, and it uh, just imprinted into my mind. So that that was uh, early Rafa Sparza. That sounds right. Yeah, no part of that sounds mm. wrong. Mm. Yeah, because I'll tell you the vivid memory I have of you is where it starts to click for me, like mm. who John Evans is. You're in a gi. At this time, you're a purple belt, a long-standing purple belt for mm. whatever reason. Mm. Not that that's become a history that we both share. But when he's over by, like, these windows that – I don't know if you remember for that gym in particular, but they had to be, like, gated kind of windows. Oh, yeah, yeah. So they had to have, like, yeah. those bars on yeah. it. But they gave a certain kind of hue, a certain kind of, like – gloss glow to anybody standing by them so you're instructing you're Ooh, by it okay and i learned very quickly the john evans structure which is to have energy drink in hand and just kind of be processing posture is very good but you're you're contemplative in thought and you would just kind of be like watching this do some bullshit warm-ups and then i think the part that started clicking is that i have a particular way i like to learn and that I will insult the technique, but I'll do it. So I'll never like outright say this is dumb, but I know that some of these are dumb for me. Like I'm like, my body can't do this. So when you're teaching something like an inversion, I go, that's cool. Everybody else can go do that. What am I doing, John? And so mm. even though I'll say that, mm. I will try it. But I do have a vivid memory of you doing your damnedest. And I swear to God, this is where I think I realized you were a saint. Is you're like, Raph, if you want to learn a beer and bolo, you just go down in a line and you just do this and you just go over your shoulder and you just kind of roll on it and you go to the side. And I looked at mm. you and I was like, I understand the words you're saying. <laughs> I want you to see what it looks like, John. And then you'd be like, oh, no, 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 no. Let me show you again. And I go, this is clearly not the issue, John. <laughs> And you kept saying it. And I was like, I don't think it's going to happen for me. And you were like, no, you're going to get it. it. Oh, you you can get this. I know you can deep inside. And I think it was the, not the time I broke you, but it was the time that I think I did one that looked passable enough where you're like, yeah, okay. All right. And we moved on. And I said, all right, I got the good enough. Not, not that it was good. But yeah, my very first memories were of you leading class like that. And I think the first time we kind of recognize that you like to do breakdowns of videos, it intersected my area of I like to talk. So then we had a kinship of I know this, you know that. And we'll kind of feed off each other in that way. So we went from being like, oh, I'm just a student to, hey, man, do you want to come cover Metamorphosis with me? Yes. Yes. Oh man, you're really jogging the, the the memories and the feels. Uh, that's hilarious. So so like all joking aside, like remembering the one thing I do remember. I remember you were so difficult. Um, but the thinking about the two of us because I was very like one track mind. Uh, yeah. You know, I, was, I think I was training at Cabrinhas probably at that time. It was just like competition, the meat grinder of a school <laughs> that it was. It was just every like like worlds and pan am purple belt blue belt brown belt champ was there from all around and like everyone was just so good and so athletic and uh it took me like a year uh before i got acclimated to the gi enough to to at least like hold my own there um and uh because everyone was so good with like the sporty grips that i wasn't used to at the time uh and 
like, so I was so in this world where I'm, I'm this competition jujitsu person or aspiring and I'm training with all the best people and it's, it's so tough and everyone's so good and talented. Like, you know, like Isaac Doderlein yeah. became world champion of black belt not that long ago, um, was super talented even back then. But he had remember him like driving from Arizona and like sleeping on a couch just so you go train as like a blue belt. And it was just like, and he was so like, you show him one thing once and he would just pick it up and be amazing at it. And it, pretty much everybody else was like that too. Um, he was an extreme example because he was just so good and so natural with it, but uh, obviously became black belt world champion. But, um, but everyone else was like not far behind. Like everyone was really good there. And so being in that and being like, I was the dumb one there. Like I'm trying to like pick up all these things and everyone else is just super good with it immediately. And then going and teaching at like a, a more casual school and being like showing stuff that I probably shouldn't have been showing at all and being mad that's like, I remember like I would never show it yeah. and I would never like be angry at students like visibly um, or I try not to be. Uh, and I remember like showing these probably way too complicated things to a bunch of like, uh, you know, like a lot of the, the school was like, there was like older people in it and, and white and, and blue belts. Yes. So and yeah. casual and brand yeah. new. And I'd be showing really complicated stuff that was like cutting edge and just being like very frustrated that everyone didn't pick it up first try. Like they did at Cabrinha's and it's like, you know, it's like, uh, well, you know, they don't do this all of, for, uh, you know, nine hours a day, every you know, six days a week. So they, yeah. And this person just got off of like, you know, a knee surgery or what it, you know, <laughs> it's just like, there was just so many, you know, it's a, it was a more casual gym with like a lot of older people that are hobbyists. And, uh, so it's so funny. Like I was so stubborn and then you were also so stubborn too. So like the two of us together must've been like a comedy of errors. Like you be just like barambolo and you being like my neck i'm not gonna barambolo and me being like yes John, you will look at this <laughs> giant head you were never going to win this battle <laughs> like despite and the worst part is i would explain this to people i was like it's nothing but positive energy being thrown at me it's more so i think for better or worse i do have a good amount of self-awareness so that i think that when i see something i go uh-oh uh, I don't know. <clears throat> and it wasn't me being like, oh, John, you're a bad instructor. No. It no. was me looking at you and being like, John, we're the bad news bears. What are we going to do with this? Yeah. Like, I recognize my power levels. I am not here. But I would try it. Yeah. I, every would. single time. You would. I no. would just give you the preface, sir, I don't know who this Isaac Doter line is. I'm not him. But Okay. And then I would try it. And every once in a while, I would be surprised. But I just, I always have this mentality of like being outside of myself and watching myself doing it. And then I think that's where the humor comes in where you go, this is going to look real dumb real quick. All right, let's try it. But yeah, I do remember you over time, I think, came to learn what it is that my issue is. Is it's like, no, there's nothing wrong with you. I clearly recognize what my limitation is, or I could read the room and be like, yeah, none of us are going to get this, John. This, this isn't going to happen. It, it was, it was a bit of both, right? Like it was, <laughs> it was like, it was me doing like being a newer teacher. Like I still been teaching for a while, but, um, but it was like, I, I was much more immature in my journey sure, of sure. through jujitsu and teaching and, uh, being very focused on like, top level sport competition style <laughs> and like I was doing all this tape study and I was commentating like at least before, even before flow grappling like on my own YouTube channel for years which is kind of how I got hired as uh, with them and um, you know like I was just so in it and then I go to, to teach at this place um, and then you were there and it was just a bunch of like the uh, hobbyists and me being so like, uh, like I didn't realize it at all in the time. Like, uh, but looking back on it now that you brought some of this up, I'm like, oh my god! Like, it, it was just like it, probably pretty hilarious. And like, I was convinced everyone I could, I was a good enough teacher. I could make everyone learn this thing that was like, you know, like people don't even know like what a daily heva guard is necessarily. And I'm like, oh, you well, here's we're gonna Baron Bull and we're gonna go to crab ride and we're just gonna, <laughs> you know, appear in 
behind this guy's back and it's just going to be incredible and people are like i what's what's a, an inversion it, what's a sideways shoulder roll I th- I've, I've seen the forward one like uh, you know and uh, but you also being so stubborn too and being like more conservative with the what you thought you could do as well and the two of those things clashing like oh man i'm surprised we didn't like get it is a miracle that we did become friends i (laughs) think the more we analyze that part i just thought it was so funny that i try to piece it together where people have those first memories of their experiences so for me uh, you know like i never talk about my first experiences really i just kind of like ask people about theirs but i was like oh john knows how i was when i first showed up and now that i am an instructor been there yeah, I've been yeah. there where I'm like, hey, yeah. how is it? Um, you know, mm-hmm. well, let's put it uh-huh. this way. Hold on. I'm stubborn. But I'm also, mm. because mm. I can read the room, John, mm. I'm like mm. some people like, that's, that's, everybody, that's everybody that's gets A pluses. We can do this forever. I'd be like, nah, some of you are C students. I know this. Listen, I was a C student too, but I gave maximum effort as an A plus. But some of you do suck. And I won't name names. But if you want to know, I'll tell you after class in private you can seek him out at milton's uh, absolutely <laughs> you like this level of, of confidence in your hey, abilities you know what, listen i will say i think my benefit as an instructor is where our <laughs> venn diagram coexists mm. is that we both just get really passionate about something so we both sure. are like no i know you can do x or y but i like to tell people i'm like okay i'm not going to cure this in one day so we got to make small battles. So what I do is I'm like, <clears throat> if I'm teaching, I go, I need you to get one concept. If you get half guard today, I don't need the sweep today. I need the sweep in two months. But for right now, if you can get from being in mount or in a bad position and learn how to make yourself in a defensive position, then you understand that. And now you're going to ask yourself, well, how do I get out of this position? And then we're going to be able to expand that knowledge. But man, do you want them to get the sweep right ahead? Because it's like we were working on the sweep. So I have a student right now where it's difficult for him to to move in certain ways. So I'll go to him and I'm like, hey, this isn't going to work for you in this way. Here's the cheat code. And what I do is I realize a lot of times I'm talking to myself where I go, ah, I need this cheat code. This is what everybody does. Or if you have a smaller student and you go like, hey, come here. Um, this dude's going to be really heavy on you and it's going to suck. And if you let your weight get misplaced here, you will not get up. Here's what you do. And then I'll go tell the big guy, I'm like, here's what I want you to do. Go put full weight on him. And I really create like terrible these, coach. No, 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 this is great. <laughs> no, you go. These are, these are mini clashes. Mm. And then after I give them all their, their secret information, I just sit back and I go, all right, everybody roll. This is great. Look at these dummies. Oh, God, he's going to beat the shit. I told you he's going to get on top of you. And then you were. "Mm." Then when I come back out of it, I say, what'd you learn? What did we find? And he's like, dude, I need that hook in. And I go, did you get it? And he goes, I got once I got that butterfly hook, I could space him out. Mm. And I go, now you understand if he's too heavy on you, it's hard to come back if you're smaller. Size does matter in this weird world. Yes, if you're a little dude, you have to do jujitsu a different way. If you're a female, sometimes these are more beneficial on top. But if you have those things, you almost have to do them to failure to need to invent a way out of it. And that I think is usually the best way my jujitsu works is when I go, "Uh uh-oh, we've hit a roadblock here, John. Uh, You were right. I need to make this happen. Because if you don't have the failure and you just do the drilling, then they become mindless drones and they're like, but I drill and I do so good and why I no win. And you go, because you expected the result without feeling what the consequence was. I, I hate how good of a coach you've become, Raph, like, <laughs> for, for, for how stubborn you were back then. <laughs> and like I was like, there's no way this guy's sticking with it long enough to... to to de- de- post a and, show yeah. and commentate yeah. with me, this. but like you've become like really analytical and a good coach, and it's like, oh man, I was I, I was totally wrong, right? Like, uh, I mean, especially right in the beginning where you're the most 
like, no, I can't do this. I can't do anything. I'm, look at me. Like, I'm, I'm, I, I can't move that well or whatever. Like, you were so stubborn about, like, probably as stubborn as to I was forcing fair, you to do you, things that you if, probably shouldn't have been doing hold on, at the if time. If you hear the way I'm setting it up, it mm. is shtick that I'm doing to you. Mm. Like, even when you do it, it's literally, I'm like, wait, did I really sound like such an asshole? I'm like, no, it's Don Rickles. What am I supposed to do here? I'm a stick. What am I, what am I doing here, John? <laughs> like, that's how I know. I'm like, no, that's mm. very accurate. Mm. It's just how it's interpreted is uh. you're like, Nah, this dumb fucking <laughs> stubborn student. Meanwhile, I'm like, man, I was I was crushing that. Yeah, that was a good just, bit that I was doing back yeah, then. Yep, that's true. So, okay, John, mm -hmm. go back. Had us all fold. Back in time. Mm -hmm. First class. What was it like? What do you remember? Uh oh man. It was here in LA. Uh, I learned rolling heel hook and day one. Day one. First class. That was the first day and went. after that it was a neck crank from Mount. <laughs> and I was only stayed at that place for uh, <laughs> two weeks, and we never learned to mount escape. Um, <laughs> uh, and then I got neck cranked from mount eventually so hard by somebody that started the same day as I did. Um, but he was much bigger than me, and I didn't, it, like, he got to mount, and I couldn't, I didn't know how to escape, and he just did the thing that we learned first day, and I couldn't lift my arm above my shoulder for, like, two months. <sighs> And I was like, maybe this isn't the school. <laughs> like when I, as I looked at online and it was like, people were like, no, this, like you shouldn't be getting kind of injured like this uh, in your first two weeks training. That's not a good thing. So I was like, okay. Like, uh, which is weird because like the, the owner was very knowledgeable and a very nice guy actually, but it was more of like um, the curriculum wasn't, at least at the time, wasn't set for beginners very well. Mm -hmm. And partially they had, it was probably me, like joining, like oh, I could probably do the mixed class, or I like I could, I've I've watched some some uh, ultimate fighting. I could probably <laughs> jump jump into the advanced class when I couldn't, um, and uh, that's what happened. Uh, but also, like some of the students were a little bit aggressive as well, which is not really like that's not not a knock on my owner or anything. Yeah. It's just that can happen sometimes. So, um, but uh, yeah, unfortunately, that was like my my first experience with jujitsu. So it's a uh, I'm kind of surprised that I stayed with it, honestly. How are you able to make it better for you? Like, how are you able to kind of get to a place where you're like, I think I found my gym? Well, after two months, I could like lift my arm above my shoulder again. <laughs> like, I was like, I think I'm ready to try this again, which is, oh man, like uh, not, not the quickest learner. So, sure. um, uh, so that I joined a different gym and uh, this gym was much safer, mm. but the but still, I didn't love like some aspects about it, like the culture and, and stuff like that. And I didn't feel like I was learning at the pace that I needed to learn. I won my first tournament, did my first tournament, did horrible, was like, was like what's an adrenaline dump? Like, oh, I didn't realize a human could be this tired and uh, feel this bad. <laughs> and that was very shocking. And of course, so I did another one. That wasn't enough for me. Um, and then I won that second one and then I got promoted very quickly to blue belt. Um, it was like uh, less than six months, and uh, which uh, unfortunately was not a trend that uh, continued after that. <laughs> like <laughs> stuck at each belt after that forever. But um, but yeah, so like it, it was you know I, I learned a bit there, and it was a, a much safer introduction to it, mm -hmm. um, which is important. But ultimately, I was not going at the pace like I was going to be a world champion, of course, because I started at the young age of 25. So I've set myself up for, for success. Um, so I needed to be at a, a more cutting edge gym. Um, and then I, I left and I, I found another gym, but it's really, as you know, like it's really difficult. And this is for everyone in jujitsu to like, like people that end up at good gyms, like it's a lot of that's like luck, right? Yeah. It's like when you're starting out, you don't know what you don't know. So the, you could, if you're a brand new white belt, like you could go to the best school in the world and go to a really terrible school and and you try to like compare the two and you, you'd be hard pressed to come up with things that were not jujitsu related that would be like a reason to go to each one, right? Like I think they, they talk more at this one. Right. They both show techniques, which one's better. Like you have no idea. So it's really difficult when you're brand new to jujitsu and um, it's, it's hard to tell and you won't know like the culture of a gym until you've been in it for a while or, or at least until you've trained for a while and uh, you could gather some of that information from 
things that you hear from other students or whatever. Um, and just in their first two years of training, that's very difficult to gauge. So um, I honestly like don't know how people end up at good gyms. It's I think it's a lot of it's just luck. So it's it's so difficult. But um, but yeah, so uh, like I uh, luckily like I went and tried another gym and I was like, I think this one's better. I'm definitely hearing a lot of weird words that I don't know. And like, <laughs> like, I, I think there's like a lot of stuff that I never learned at the other one. And like, uh, I'm going to try it. And then I tried like, could I do it for like the rest of the month for free to try it out, which is like a kind of a terrible thing to ask of a gym owner um, a little bit, um, but happens all the time. But, it, you know, like if it's just like I think it was like a week and a half basically left over and, and the guy agreed. Um, and so I did that. And then at the end of that, I was like, oh, I could never go back to the other gym now. Like you, you see it enough to just be yeah. like thinking about going back. And I was like, oh, no. And so the, and I learned a ton at that gym. And that was with Sean Williams, a gr great instructor. Um, talk about luck. Oh, talk man. about <laughs> super, <laughs> luck, super <laughs> lucked out. Um, who also commentates as well. And he's just a, just a wealth of knowledge. And um, if you guys don't know him, of course, he got his, he's like uh, Dan and her friend. They got their black belt the same day, both from Enzo Gracie. And uh, it's just an absolute uh, great instructor. Yeah. Um, incredible technician. So really lucked out there. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, it could have, I could have ended up at some other horrible place and it would have been just like a roll of the dice right like I, I wouldn't have known i mean fate has its way of playing out i i don't know i mean i would like to imagine our paths would have crossed given our interests and how i would probably have found my way into commentary because i felt like i can add something there and that you were gravitating toward that because you found it as a pathway and it seemed like the next step as somebody who before I even knew you were making videos of talking about techniques and being a student and a teacher. So I feel like we might have still found each other. But the fact that fate dumped us at the same gym and then for me to be a student of yours and then us kind of have our, I mean, he's really good at teaching, but not good at teaching me. <laughs> and then you being like, all right, he seems nice, but he's dumb. Just at jujitsu dumb, like jujitsu dumb, but I guess good heart and he has a good one liner here and there. And I think that we were able to bypass that and connect a certain thing of you were learning from somebody who was a commentator as well. I was learning from somebody who was a commentator as well. So then you kind of have those worlds mix. It just seems only natural in a certain way. I like to ask this as the follow up to that question. Mm. When did you actually fall in love with jujitsu? Now. It's an insane proposition, but it's one that I like to present to people for this main reason. You have this. You became a black belt. You commentate it. There has to be something or a moment that makes you say, I'm going to do this as more than just a hobby. So do you have that moment that you have pinpointed or that you think is around a certain era or time? I don't know if I have a moment, like a specific moment, but I know, like, obviously I'm stubborn. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I like technical things. And I remember, uh, I mean, I think a lot of people fall in love with jujitsu for the same reasons as I did, where it's like, uh, it's one of the few things where it's like, you, especially in the beginning, you can directly correlate the amount of effort put in to the amount of reward you get out, right? It's like one of the few things where it's just like, oh, I tried extra hard and I drilled extra and I learned this one thing and then now I can use it. And now I don't get stuck under these huge people that are trying to kill me, right? Like it's like I can actually get on top and not be crushed. And that's like, like oh my God, like that's crazy. Like the, it's a real skill and you start to like, well, if I was ever needed self-defense, I could use it. And it's like a real world thing too that could help maybe keep you safe. Of course, you have an inflated um expectation <laughs> of what you can do is like uh yeah of course if there's 30 people and they had swords and they're the pirate ship and i would just <laughs> i would be their commander eventually it's like uh, like but um you know like blue belt dreams right so it's like uh, uh but um it's it, i think just seeing that and i'd never seen that in i don't think anything else ever before in in life like there's usually like a steep curve and then a plateau um or a very slow curve right where it's like you don't you put in tons of work and you don't see much out of it and it's going to take a long time and this 
you, you put in a lot more, you get a lot more, and it's still going to take a long time, but it's like, oh, all of a sudden it's on a curve too. So you're like way better than these other people over here that are doing like half the amount of work. Um, and uh, in, in five more years of doing that same trajectory, uh, you're going to be exponentially better than those people, right? On, this, on their same path. So um, that's like really a great feeling. And I think that kind of like ropes a lot of people in. Um, and especially when you start to see reward, you start getting better than other people that were better than you uh, when you started. It's like, oh, this is like legit. Um, and uh, like the, all that stuff is really good, I think. But it's also like a trap as well because... <laughs> No, don't say. Absolutely. How dare you? John, yes. we got to sell memberships yes. here. What are you doing? You, you come down to the best trap in no. Hollywood, <laughs> and we will make sure you're very good at the thing, no. and you excel as quickly as possible, and th then you've, like, yes. Uh, no, it's a very fruitful thing. John's, like, the one person that listens to a song called Trap Queen and goes, I don't see an issue. She's getting what she deserves. Absolutely. This is, uh, this is the way we, we – this is the marketing. <laughs> well, you know what? You've learned a lot. Good job. Yes. But you did find, obviously for you, a scientist at heart. You found your love of it through this application of something that you would be able to learn, figure out how you were doing, measure it, and then see how you were doing. And you notice that at certain points, you were starting to do better in certain ways than maybe some of even your peers or you were advancing certain ways. I think that really speaks well to the type of person that you are and, and your approach to jujitsu. I just, the reason why I ask the question always is, you know, there's something that kind of grounds all of us in the same way. And I'm always wondering, like, how did you end up staying with this? Like I yeah. did. And my thing, my appeal has always been, yeah, I do like the science of it, but I also like the imperfection of it, of I'm never going to be perfect at it, and that drives a perfectionist crazy. Yes. So then you just sit here and you go, well, let's just continue to just get as good as we can. Yep. So for you, you know, did it, did it have a moment of click where you go like, I feel like I do have a handle on this. I do feel like I'm, I'm part of that group that like, really enjoys this and that really takes uh entertaining value or or perspective that is great from it yeah that's uh, actually uh, i mean all joking aside uh it's um the the reason that i say it's like it's a trap is just because there's especially when when i was starting and uh, probably to an extent when you were starting too a minute ago um and there's like there just wasn't much money in it. And there's a lot of like, like you don't realize there's a lot of uh, not great people in it behind the scenes. Um, and the, the, they can hide that very well, right? Uh, and you don't see that until you have to deal with them on like a, maybe like a financial level or you, you see when like things come down to brass tacks, you see people's like true side. Um, and you don't realize like, even if you look at like the history of like American Jiu Jitsu and like, oh, well, there were some people that were like, doing well against people, even like top competitors from Brazil. Like what happened to the, oh, they're in jail? Okay, like what happened to the, that's yeah. something like it's, it's, there's like a lot of, and especially early on, there was like a lot of like, more like thugs that were attracted yeah. to the sport. So you got, like it, it brought a bad crowd too. And now it's so much different. It's like so much safer. And with the explosion of instructionals, like people are more technical, um, technically minded. There's a freer flow of information, which makes everything better. Um, there's a, a lot of this like taboo now that there's YouTube and tape you can study of like secret techniques and all this cloak and dagger stuff. So it's like getting so much better all the time. It's so much better now to start jujitsu than it was back when like you just kind of like rolled the dice and prayed that you we were in a good gym and no one would catastrophically injure you and you'd actually like learn good stuff. Right. Yeah. But, um, now it's much, much easier, thankfully. Uh, so it's getting better all the time, like kind of at an exponential rate, but um, much safer now to start jujitsu. But um, but to stay in it, like through all of that stuff, it can be difficult to stay the course. But for me personally, I think I was injured because uh, there's always injuries, no matter how safe or good a school is. Like it's just a physical sport. We're not playing, you know, connect forwards. <laughs> We're out here like uh, trying to simulate um, murder in pajamas. So. Uh, or no gi too. And, and it's, um, so it's, it's just tough. There's going to be, sometimes you just like twist your ankle or whatever and you're out. So 
when I was out, I tried to like watch tape and be productive with my time. And I think when I realized I was watching some stuff where when I watched maybe two years prior, I had no idea. I was watching like the world's like maybe the, the finals or something like that. And I had no idea what was going on in the finals, like zero. I'm like, I, I know this guy's winning on score. I don't know what's happening really. I don't know why they're doing this or why this worked or whatever. And then like two, three years later, I think um, I was training with Sean quite a bit from then. And I watched tape again and I was like, I understand most of this, like probably nearly all of it, at least to some level. Right. And I was like, man, that it was like three and a half years or four years of training before that happened. I'm like, that's a really long time to be in something before you start to understand what's happening, you know, in the competition scene. Uh, and I'm like, I wonder if I could just um, impart this to people uh, through like video or something. So I started, that's when I started doing commentary on video. And I think that was like kind of my, my moment where I'm like, oh, I've actually like learned quite a bit and I've done something with my time. And this is like, now I feel like I'm getting something real out of this finally, right? Um, even though I felt like I was slowly building all along and I was, but that was like the, the major moment, I think. That makes sense. And I mean, it's true to fact is that I always said that those videos that you were doing were the precursor to your, your commentary days. Mm -hmm. And really, that was where you were putting in your time. And that's why when you, you started doing it, you elevated so quickly because you had this buildup of knowledge and communicating it. And with the intention of, I want somebody watching this to pull something away. And I don't know how many people in commentary truly have that as a thing. Sometimes they just are told they're good at it. Sometimes there is a little bit of help. And sometimes, quite frankly, they don't know what they're doing. So it's a mix of all of those different things. But yours was an earnest, hey, while we're talking, why don't we try to learn what this is and figure out not only the science, but how you can replicate it. And that's where I was like, no, I get what he's doing. And I, I kind of see it. And I felt like that's where we could combine powers with my narrative yes. and my storytelling and my ability to pull what I knew you knew out of you and your ability to lean into my stories and then to be able to say like, ah, let's add this and sprinkle this on top. That's why I was like, oh, no, it, it makes perfect sense. So yeah, that works really well. Yeah, no, I was really actually very fortunate to have you, um, like, a, it's just rare that you get somebody that's so good um, at talking and knowing production and knowing like, you know, like a broadcast etiquette, all of, all of the things that like still are kind of a little bit scarce in, in the sport, uh, sadly. Um, but, uh, just coming up with somebody that happened to know all that stuff is like a, a blessing. So like, um, in the beginning, like I was just looking at certain commentators that were like doing like a hybrid cutting edge, non-traditional style. And I thought it was exciting. So I tried to emulate that, but I didn't know anything about broadcast. And so when I tried to learn more about like actual commentary, um, like taking you as an example and also asking you a lot of questions and leaning on you and taking your lead, um, really helped a lot with that. So I think that was like eh, fantastic. And uh, now I'm much better. Like, I think my commentary is probably like significantly always much, much better whenever we would commentate because yeah. you would pull the good stuff out of yeah. me then. And I didn't know how to get it out myself. Now it's uh, like, it's probably still always better with you, but like, uh, like at least I know enough from working with you now to like be able to extract more out of myself just uh, alone. Then. We started switching a little bit. Yeah. Like at a certain point, I probably became better at play by play and you probably became a better broadcaster just based off of like what we were doing. doing it, like yeah. <laughs> over time, it's like, you know, things that I would do and you figured out your version of it. Yep. And before I knew it, I was like, what, did I just call the end of this fight? Like what's happening? Yeah. Or yeah, did, you, did you I became, do this? Your technical knowledge like increased so much to, yeah. from beginning to end or beginning to now, right? Like, but it was like, we could manifest that during our classes. And mm -hmm. then that became like our showcase where yeah. I go, oh, I heard how he managed to communicate this. And I saw people nodded or received that knowledge, this, or I could see they did the move in class. If we tell it to them like this, the audience might get it a certain way. Yep. So, I, I mean, it's just without getting too technical on it, it, it's inevitable. Like that was going to happen between the two of us. Yeah, so, super cool though. 
Um, well, John, I think we've definitely run the gamut on a number of things. What I would like for you to do is there's a camera right there. That one belongs to you. Ooh. I would like you to look into that camera and tell mm. people why they should come visit this beautiful, wonderful academy and come train with you, sir. So camera uh, is all yours. All right. Um, yeah, I think for a lot of the reasons that we talked about oh, over this uh, entire show is um, it's tough. Like when you're starting out, especially if you're starting out, uh, people that are more established that have trained with me already know. And then we've got like, you know, when we opened this place, we had more black belts than white belts, which is an unusual problem to have, right? So um, it's because uh, the majority of your students should be like white and blue belts just because that's uh, the majority of people that train jujitsu, right? <laughs> um, but uh, but that's not the way that we started. But um, so the, the established people know me, but the newer people, I think, is where they would benefit the most because um, you don't know what you don't know and it's hard to find a good gym and find a gym that will um, put stock in you and invest in you and, and really like uh, bring you along the proper way and make sure that you're safe and that you're safe to other people and that you learn as quickly as possible too. Um, and when you have like a good gym culture like that, that brings everyone up, um, you know, like the, the whole purpose of, or one of the purposes of starting this is that, you know, as this gym grows, like maybe we get to 500 plus students eventually, you know, I can't watch every single person all the time, but if you do it right from the beginning, you'll have a good gym culture where it's like, as already so many of my students that I have, especially ones that have been with me for a while, um, help out newer people, uh, in ways that like, I can't physically like, I just don't have the time to yeah. go around to everyone and see everyone all the time. So here you will really be brought up as quickly as possible. And it's whether it's from me or the other students, um, everyone is safe, uh, which is super important. If you get your knee blown out in the first year of training, you're not going to train for a very long time if you need surgery, right? So we try to avoid uh, any <laughs> catastrophic injuries, which is really um, understated sometimes. Uh, so that's really important. And you'll learn very technical stuff here that you can carry with you forever. Um, and my goal is to get people as good as possible because it's good for the gym, right? It's, it's good when they when outsiders see like, oh, this person improved this much that quickly. That's uh, really unusual. Um, and look at like they're safe and they're lovely to train with and they can train with um, a top like a world champion at a competitive level and at least hold their own. But they could also train with somebody that's like a senior citizen that is brand new to jujitsu and they could be um, very safe with them too. So it's like a, and have a, a great technical knowledge. So those things are difficult to find and you will absolutely get that here. Well, I'm glad that you have opened up an academy. I definitely will be visiting here. It is just from a personal standpoint, wonderful to see you doing what you're supposed to do. Like you are an incredible teacher and as a testament to your want of what you want to pull out of your students and make them capable jujitsu practitioners who help each other and build that culture, there was no part of me that was ever going to be a jujitsu instructor. Like ever. But it happened. Yeah. And a large part of that is you have to see examples of things that you eventually can see yourself emulating. And I would not be one unless I had a good instructor. So a lot of that is credited to you. And I know there's a lot of times when I'm teaching stuff, much in the way you're crediting Sean, Cobrina, a lot of people that you grew up with where I go, oh, this is a John Evans thing. He does this. It's really good for him. I don't do it as well, but I'll teach you the ghetto version. And I love when we have similar stories where I can send somebody like Brady and I'm like, listen, dude, we work great together go to the source. You fight, you compete at a high level. I'm always going to be a great training partner to you. That's the guy. And now he trains with you and I couldn't be happier. And his progress is phenomenal. So there's always that, that line. But to me, I think that's how you know this is a great place. Like that's how you know the instruction and the culture you built is going to continue to be great because I see it with so many of your students. So I very much am happy to see this back in existence. All is right in the world again. And um, yeah, congratulations to you, sir. Thank you, Raph. I, I appreciate it. And it's, it's great. I can't believe I've been teaching so long now. I mean, I've been teaching over 15 years, but like 
it's uh, still surprising to see like, wow, I've been teaching so long, I could see a student become an instructor and become a good one. And it's just like, I, I just never realized I've been doing it this long to, to be able to see that. It's a great feeling, honestly, but it's also surprising and, and cool. Um, but, um, but like, that's awesome for me. I, I love seeing that from you. And you really have improved so much. It's, it's incredible. Um, and I love that. Uh, also, one last thing, if I may. Yeah. Um, just because I, I hate it when people like say what's wrong with things and don't offer a solution. Yeah. And it's like not everyone is in Hollywood, uh, California, right? Yeah. Like no, not everyone's around L.A. and can come and train here. And it's really important that you have um, a good gym that you go to. So if you're thinking about jujitsu or you're new to jujitsu and you want to find a place that is good, like, and you, you don't know what you don't know. So, um, just, uh, if I can offer some unsolicited advice, please try to just find a gym that is, um, technically minded. Cause whether, whether you glaze over when people are te te teaching technique or not, that is still like an important thing to have in a gym and have your, ins an instructor that, um, has a technical mind that can help you out with those things because you probably need it even more if you if you're like averse to it. Um, uh, that's one. And two, find a place where the owner and the and or the head instructor really cares cares about people, cares about your progress, and is looking out for for everyone. So that like those two things are super important, and those things you can kind of figure out without knowing too much jujitsu. Um, or at least uh, start to get um, a feel for when you go to different gyms and then try a bunch of different gyms and try to find the best one that fits those two criteria. And trust your gut. You know. If you ever have a moment where you go, I don't know about this place, you're probably right. You just need to kind of figure out what your terms are or what's there. But when you know you're at the spot, you know. So I, I think as people who have been to multiple gyms and people who have been around other people, we've seen bad cultures exist. Sure. And yeah. I just always tell people, get out. And the hardest thing for me is always when there's a good training partner and I go, I don't think you're going to mix well here. Mm -hmm. It's hard to be like, I think this is where you need to go. Even though I want to train with you, my caveat over the years has been, well, you're welcome to come train with me like anytime you want. But if you're a competitive person, you kind of need to go to a gym like this. If you're a hobbyist and you're afraid of getting injured, yeah, that's cool. Mm, they're a little rough. Maybe not there. So even against some of my own will at times, I've made recommendations uh, to other gyms when I'm like, damn, they'd be a great training partner for me. But I just think like I remember what it was like to try and find the right gym that worked for you. And man, it is it is tough, especially when you you don't know. You just think well, they teach really good and they can beat me up. And it's like, well, it's more than just that. Most people can beat you up. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a matter of what are you taking away from that? Yeah. And how are they empowering you to be a better version of your smell self to be smart and make decisions for yourself? Because that's the hardest part is you can teach moves all day long, but if the concepts just fall on the floor, yeah. uh, what are we doing here? Yep. You know. So I think that was one of the benefits was I would just tell people, I'm like, you know, I'm huge king on nope concept. Tell me what you're doing. Yep. And if you can communicate that to me, that's where I'm best. Like I know how the communication part works, but if you're struggling here, then that's what we have to kind of like doctor and do. And we can give you fancy little drills, but at its core, if you don't have a game plan, yeah, you're going to get the shit kicked out of you a lot. <laughs> and it really does suck. Yep. That's true. Anyway. All right, Good John. Point. Well, let's put a pin on this for now. Uh, we'll definitely be seeing each other at more Spar Stars and more training. But in the meantime, thank you guys for watching. Reminders, check us out. Patreon, like, comment, and subscribe. All that good jazz. I told you, if you hung out this long, yes, we'd give you something to comment on. If you want to comment on something right now, I'll give you something to comment on. What do you think I was like? Now, you heard from him, and I don't know. This could be a very very biased interpretation here that he's now trying to basically Disney buy <laughs> and change all these years later. Mm, mm. All of a sudden Han shot first. We mm. don't know. We don't know. Mm, mm. But I would tell you this. If you want to go ahead and put there, why don't you tell me in the comment section what you think I was like day one? Because 
uh, everybody has a different interpretation of it. I was a great student. I don't know what John was talking about. <laughs> Day one, I was great. A plus. <laughs> Uh, you can also check us out. We mentioned the patreon.com backslash grappling hour, like, comment, and subscribe, YouTube, all that good stuff, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on Discord, all that great. All right, guys, it has been a great day for grappling. We'll see you back on the mats. <laughs>